Good morning, everyone, um, and welcome to our 2022 Humanities Symposium on Boredom. Uh, I just want to let you know that we have people joining us from uh, different areas today. We have some people here in the auditorium. We have people joining us uh, from their classrooms, and we have people also joining us uh, from the comfort of their homes. So welcome to everyone. Um, for those of you who are online, if uh, at some point during the symposium, uh, during the talk today, you would like to ask a question, uh, you can write your question in the Q&A and we'll get to those uh, at the end uh, of the talk. Mm -hmm. And anybody here in the auditorium, I also welcome you guys to ask questions. You can see a mic right here and you can just get up, walk to the mic and ask your question. I really encourage you to take advantage uh, of being here to do that. Next, I'd like to uh, give a quick word of thanks to the Humanities Symposium Committee for putting this together. And most of all, to Lily Petrovich, um, who really did amazing work. Um, and I really congratulate you and thank you for that. Um, as we welcome our speaker today, Alicia, Wolf to Vanier. I'd like to take a moment to recognize where we are meeting today um, and that it's on unceded territory of the Kanagahaga Nation, a place that's long been a site of meeting among many First Nations. And if we could bear this in mind to actually prompt our action in building more just relationships with all First Nations. Dr. Alicia Wolf is a neuroscientist who, as senior lecturer in the cognitive science department at Rensselaer Polytechnic uh, Institute, she is investigating uh, the connection between well being and contemplative practice to understand the body brain relationship as they relate, in particular, to resiliency, well being, and creativity. These studies are conducted in part within the framework of the classroom environment, so as to contribute to improved practices that support growth and resiliency, hopefully in students' lives. So we all should be particularly excited uh, to listen to her ideas today, as who among us couldn't do with a little more resiliency and well-being? Dr. Alicia Wolf, on behalf of all of us, welcome. Thank you so much. And good morning. Um, first of all, of course, I wanna thank the organizers of this meeting and the audience um, for giving me this opportunity to share my thoughts today. I'm usually asked to speak about my research on stress and well-being, and also practices that I use in the classroom. Um, these are things that are very close to my heart and my brain, um, but I'm really thrilled to come here and share some of my thoughts about how boredom plays a role in these other processes. Um, we're going to have some audience interaction. I'll invite you to interact. Um, nothing to be worried about right now or anything. Um, and then, yes, answering questions at the end will be wonderful. And here we have a picture of our campus in Troy, New York, and kind of a nicer day than today. So we'll just pretend it's nice and beautiful in the fall, not the snowy winter. All right, so in terms of what we're doing today, some of our goals, I'll do a bit of an introduction and then really focusing on these three topics of stress, well-being, and boredom. Not exactly in this order, they're kind of, there's threads going throughout, which you'll see. To start off, I wanna introduce, okay, who am I? I did just hear a nice introduction, thank you for that. But I wanted to talk about the field and kind of my perspective before getting into what, what I'm gonna share with you. So I'm a behavioral neuroscientist. So that means I really try to understand how the brain works by focusing on behavior as the endpoint. So less so on these other aspects of neuroscience. Really the idea is how to, maybe um, neurotransmitters working at the molecular level, or in my case, I really study hormones. How do those have actions in neurons? But then really the end point is looking at behavior, behavior of individuals on their own or at the social level. So in this kind of field, studying unobservable and subjective mental states, which I'm really interested in, like things like emotions and memory, 
really relies upon some kind of behavioral output. So for example, specifically studying stress and its role in cognition, I might ask individuals to rate their stress levels as a measurable way to understand and study their subjective states. So in behavioral neuroscience, we're also interested in studying these brain processes across species and trying to understand those relationships. I'm gonna focus on humans today, but just so you kind of have a broader understanding of this field. But I have to admit, I have to, I guess, confess really that I don't study the brain mechanisms of boredom per se. So why am I here? Really, I like to offer up my thinking relating to these studies on stress and well-being and classroom teaching, which I spend the majority of my time doing um, in the classroom in my role as a senior lecturer at Rensselaer. And I'll tell you some stories about how this kind of work has led me to think more about boredom. So I will talk about boredom for sure. Um, now I study humans in the wild. So I don't study humans in a laboratory setting per se. So I study stress and well-being in everyday situations, kind of humans in their natural environments. So some of these um, places are the classroom, even when they're at home, especially nowadays with all of our Zoom meetings, um, studying humans when they're involved or um, a spectator at like art performances, during contemplative practices, and even in office spaces. So I'll tell you some of those past research and other experiences that have led me to think more about boredom. So first, you know, with all that in mind, let's try something, something interactive. Of course, this is up to you. Um, if you want to and are able to, let's start with holding our hand, hands or one hand open wide with five fingers up. Next, I'll ask you to put a finger down if you've ever been in a classroom and looking at a clock, wishing it was closer for the lesson to be over. Working on a task that you have to complete but you do not really want to. Unsure of what to do next after you have completed a task. Waiting for something with nothing else to do. Lastly, you're stuck in a little square box and yet another Zoom meeting. So you probably came up with now having a fist, right? Um, likely this is the case. This is one thing about boredom. We could have done probably the same kind of activity and I asked you different questions about stress. And I hope, you know, I know from uh, understanding stress that yes, we'd all end up with fists because stress is as common as boredom and something we'll talk about. But I really hope also, you know, eventually um, individuals can be doing this kind of task, thinking about ways for well being, and we'll get to that. But I also like to do things like this because um, even though I'm a neuroscientist, I like us to incorporate our bodies in some of our knowledge gaining. So what is boredom? We've, we've heard a lot about boredom. I'll offer up some of my ideas, really um, coming from other great thinkers. You know, we have this quote, what is boredom? It is when there is simultaneously too much and not enough. So that's one way to think about it. We can also think about boredom as a state. And here, what I'm offering up is really based upon the work of other presenters here, especially Professors Dankert and Eastwood. But we can think about boredom as this unpleasant state um, there's often a lack of engagement and meaningfulness. We consider the role of the self and whether individuals feel that they have agency, but also I'd like to throw in there this idea about the self-awareness of noting that feeling that you might be having and labeling it as boredom. It can be transient, but that duration depends upon agency or the individual's ability to change the circumstances, another way to put it. It's commonly experienced, right? That's why we probably had our fists. Um, it generally happens more commonly in the young. I'm thinking about our audience, uh, many members of our audience today. It's often unavoidable, but it can also be this motivational state, like as it's been described at Dankert as a call to action, or as Tolstoy described as a desire of desires. It is an intentional state, 
So thinking about that outward focus, noticing your world and also this inward focus. Now, boredom can also be a trait or this enduring characteristic where it relates to an individual's general propensity to experience boredom. You know, another thing to think about is where we get this word boredom, boredom. <laughs> um, really from this hand tool, boring tool to make a hole into a piece of wood type of thing. And, you know, as a hand tool, you place it in there and it, it's tedious and you do it over and over again, you move your hand in that same direction. What I'd also like to think about as perhaps boredom being this tool. And that's something that we'll talk about today, how it might help us in, the, in learning, and sorry, just dropped the glass. It's okay. It's in a break. Um, just was making my notes here. Sorry about that. <laughs> Woo, not bored. Okay, so I would like to, again, I'm telling some stories today. So I like to say, hey, I haven't been studying boredom explicitly, but I've always considered it, even when I was a graduate student. My interest in boredom then might have been low. Um, but I was studying the role of role brain mechanisms of hormones, particularly in the limbic system for anxiety related behaviors and, and using rodent models. And really looking at how rodents approach or avoid novel situations. And I really had to take into consideration what tasks were being used because if they were tasks where the animal seemed bored or really not as engaged, I would really be watching an animal sit there and groom themselves or sit there and fall asleep if the task was certainly too long. So this is one piece of starting to think about boredom in a completely different context than I do now. Um, you know, I wasn't really interested in the boredom per se, really interested in how the animals responded in challenging tasks, usually those involving other rodents. So some social challenges, some snacks perhaps, or other stressors, like natural stressors, maybe something like a predator order, for example. What those studies have shown um, and others is that these challenges, whether they're rewarding or punishing, quickly and reliably increase levels of not only stress hormones from the adrenal glands down in our body, um, but also hormones that are called neurosteroids. These are ones that are made in the brain they're released really quickly, almost like neurotransmitters. Um, and they are released and have actions really quickly like neurotransmitters. So they seem like more of a mechanism to make these quick changes in behavior, maybe more so than other hormones. So that's to put a lot of research in a couple sentences there. Um, and these neurosteroids can act in interesting areas of the brain like the limbic system and really change how the animals respond later. So we often think about this kind of viewpoint in my field of behavioral neuroendocrinology, where we study hormones in the brain and how it relates to behavior, where we might have that change in experience. So the animal maybe is having a social engagement, or maybe they're having some kind of feeling of boredom, right? I described sometimes they didn't do much in these tasks. They were too long and just not engaging enough. But in any case, they can be this change in hormone release, which modifies behavior. And then that mod that change in behavior then changes other experiences. And I know this is a very simple figure and it keeps going around in a circle. But this is really one way I think about stress, how we experience that and then how it changes. And of course, um, looking at the mechanisms, the hormonal mechanisms is something of interest. I'm not gonna talk too much about hormones today though, just, just so you know. Um, and, um, you know, for some time I've been studying humans, human behavior, like I had mentioned, but I'm always interested in these core responses. So ones that you see across mammals. So this is why I'm even bringing up the rats today. Um, so we're thinking about this across mammals and maybe other creatures. And there's a lot to be understood about boredom and how that influences behavior. This is what makes this conference so important. Um, and thinking about it across species, I think is something else that's really interesting. It's not reserved, boredom's not reserved just for humans. Um, but I know from personal experience, you might've heard my dogs in the background. I'm sorry about that. They're probably bored, but I certainly understand what can happen when animals are bored. Here's just some pictures 
where you know Toby here on the left decided to chew a chair, even though there's toys there, but perhaps bored. And then um, Ava over here on the right was found sleeping after getting into the recycling bin and, and tearing it up again. So I think about boredom kind of in my real life. Um, and I also know about boredom as the mother of a young child, you know, artwork going on the wall in a two-year-old, but then I'm just proud of a painting that he did a couple days ago. And again, I was in a many, many Zoom meetings one after another. So again, this interest in boredom certainly has changed. Um, and I'll get to how it's influenced my research soon <laughs> in the classroom. But you know, this, this interest in boredom has taken this kind of curve. So really thinking about boredom swiftly increased when I became a college professor. Uh, when I began teaching classes, twice each class at RPI, or Rensselaer, meets generally twice a week for two hours. Um, most of the students in my classes are engineering students or computer science students. And I don't teach engineering or computer science. So I knew I had that kind of uphill battle for engaging them. Um, and so they've often taken my courses because they need to take a course in, um, in our school, which is the School of Humanities and Social Science, or they're incoming freshmen that need to take one of the kind of well-being type courses that I teach. So there might be some lack of engagement in some of these cases. So to this end, I've been really focused on keeping students um, engagement throughout the long class period over a long semester. Um, and a task, this is a task that's been made even more difficult in recent years, of course, with remote instruction. And because I've studied stress for so many years and all kinds of animals, I also know that this kind of stress that we're all dealing with and students have dealt with even before the pandemic for sure can get in the way of cognition. Something we'll talk more about today. There can be these maladaptive consequences on things like memory or other kind of cognitive performance. So I've been really working to mitigate some of those effects um, by using a trauma-informed teaching approach, just recognizing very simply that students come into the room with stress, with traumas, and how we can try not to let that get in the way of the learning process, as well as initiating um, a program in well-being here at Rensselaer. So I'll tell you some more of those um, details momentarily. But then, as you can certainly see, and many, maybe many of us have also experienced this, this interest in boredom, both at a research and teaching um, level, but also as a mother. I showed you a picture on purpose just a moment ago. Um, you know, this interest in boredom certainly skyrocketed during this pandemic. And it likely did for many individuals. And near the end, I'll talk about some ongoing studies specifically related to what's going on during this pandemic, thinking about stress, boredom, and well being. But what about stress? What do I mean by well being? Let's get into these topics. And again, another type of activity you can do, I'm not going to ask anyone to turn anything in or, or say anything aloud. But this is something you can do on your own, I invite you. But you can think about, well, what am I stressed out by? I just mentioned some of the things uh, that stressed me out kind of in my personal life. But often answering this question is not a single fill in the blank, right? Often we might have very long lists of what we're stressed out by. And I bring this up because I think in studying stress, it's important to recognize that it's not something that can be completely avoided. This is what has led me to studying things like well being or dealing with stress. And I think a similar argument can be made about boredom. So, what do we do when we're in these situations more often than not, perhaps, and if they're getting in the way of what we want to be doing? Things for us to think about today. We probably have long lists. Of course, I, if I could, we would have actually spent more time on that. Um, but, you know, something for us to think about. But I'd say many things that stress us out can be put into different, these kind of three categories. Not to say these are the only things, but these are the ways that I really think about it. And honestly, I focus in on this. 
And there are things like uncertainty, not knowing what might happen next, what not knowing when something might end. Um, there might be there another stressor I should say is this loss of control or that loss of agency. So not knowing what you can do to maybe mitigate or minimize some of that stress. And there can also be the, a huge role of social isolation. We're social creatures, um, dealing with others can be a way to reduce stress. And when we're isolated from others, it's a major stressor. And again, it's not even just in us humans. These are ideas that I glean from also animal research. In some cases, I'll throw some of my favorite comics in here that are related. Um, these are the heart and brain comics. So I ask you to think about what you're stressed about, what can stress you out. But then it's like also, how do you know? Well, we'd say this starts at perception at a brain level. You might know that you're stressed because you have some emotional response. Maybe there's this ne generally negative re emotional response. Sometimes people describe that as like an anxious feeling. You might also notice that your heart is beating faster. That's a, it's a good key. You might notice that you're doing things like breathing maybe not as deeply, maybe almost like a panting, like a quick, short, uh, you know, shallow breaths. You might notice because you've lost your appetite or you're having difficulty concentrating. I'm just naming many different things. It all starts with the brain though, recognizing those, having that perception. Then we go back to, well, really what is stress? Like we all know what it is because I think that I can make the claim that we've all experienced it. Um, but how do we really define it? And uh, the definition comes from Dr. Hans Selye, often referred to as the father of stress. I have a picture of him over here. Um, note he has a lot of connections in Montreal. And he came to his understanding of stress by, yes, yeah, studying hormones in the really early days of hormone research, early part of the 1900s, in rodent models kind of came up with this idea almost accidentally, um, but he noticed that the animals would respond a specific way after many different challenges. And he actually published this, these first findings. I know you can't read it, it's really small, but I thought I'd just throw this up as a picture. His first findings was published as a letter to the editor in Nature, 1936. And that really started this whole field. And he had noticed what we would now call stress in the rodents that he was studying, but he also was in medical school. He's a medical doctor, focused a lot on the immune system later. Um, but he also noticed in doing clinical hours, wow, when people come in, they could have so many different ailments that bring them to the clinic, yet there's some similarities in their just the way they were. Now he wasn't a psychologist or certainly not a neuroscientist. So he didn't follow up in that same way that we might be talking about the way we study stress in, in this lecture, um, but he noted that. And so he came up with this definition that's still used today, that stress is this non-specific response of the body to any demand. Now he noted changes less so on behaviors. I mean, he didn't study those behavioral changes, he noticed them, but he really studied how it changed the body, the health of the body, the different organ systems. So then we can talk about a stressor, what I asked you about is any stimuli that can place a demand. Or another way to think about it is anything that can disrupt balance or homeostasis of an organism. And if we have these kinds of definitions, we recognize you know, we're out of balance often. You know, maybe some of us are right now, ooh, skip breakfast, you're hungry. So yeah, that would be one of those stressors that you're dealing with. Now we think about stress and how I study it and many in the field study it is by thinking about these three interacting components of the stress response. So there's hormones, Stress hormones, you've heard of adrenaline, I'm sure. That's one of many hormones that are considered stress hormones. There's changes in autonomic functions. And these ones you might notice. So you might notice your heart 
beating faster. You might notice that panting breath. You don't necessarily notice that you have hormone changes, but they're happening and guess what? They're driving some of these changes in autonomic function. Those functions that are outside of our control in many ways. And then we have behavioral or co cognitive changes with stress and that's a whole long list. And of course, as someone from more of a psychology background, I focus a lot on those and we'll, we'll talk about those. You know, how might we study this? Yeah, hormones, we might measure it in saliva in our lab. Autonomic function, we might be looking at data from smartwatches that look at heart rate, you know, um, over time, or maybe we use like a blood pressure monitor. Those are some simple ways to look at autonomic function in human subjects. And behavior and cognition, oftentimes we're looking at responses. I just have a picture here of like a Google form kind of response, looking at individuals, um, you know, self-report and other different ways we might study behavior. That's a long list. I just have one picture. Talking a bit more about these behavioral kinds of or psychological kinds of responses, you know, emotions is something that comes up. That's often what we focus on in my lab. And we do have here, this is just one way to think about emotions. I like these, this kind of thinking because we have somewhat the core emotions in the center of this like a flower. Um, and that there are also different strengths of these emotions. And that's why we have these petals. And so we do see even in this figure, we have boredom down here in the bottom left corner. And sometimes we think about emotions, especially the ones related to stress as maybe these are bad, but I think it's also just something to be aware of. Noticing those emotions, again, these emotions as a signal of what might be happening, how you're responding to the environment. So this is one reason we focus a lot on these and we might look at other things like memory and co other cognitive functions, but emotions always plays a role in the studies that we do. And I think this is an interesting way to think about emotions from Brene Brown. It's a huge part of the mythology around emotion that if we look it in the eye, it gives it power. It gives it meaning the emotion power. But the reality is if we look it in the eye and name it, it gives us power. So this is just going towards this thinking about recognizing self-awareness of whatever you're experiencing can be useful, boredom included. But we often think about stress, maybe also that some of those emotions we think, oh, these are negative. Sure, you know, stress engages every major organ system in the body. This is Celia had started to recognize this way long ago. And this is still something that people recognize. We often think about those maladaptive effects of stress, but really we're talking about stress over time, having those maladaptive effects. The idea for stress is really as a signal and it can be adaptive, it's in the short term. Your body, you recognize there's maybe a danger, you engage all these systems, blood is flowing out to the muscles, perhaps for that fight or flight response, for example. You shut down things like digestion for that moment because you're dealing with that stressor, just to name a few of these systems. And that can be adaptive, that can be um, bring you to safety. But again, it can be maladaptive when chronic. When we think about the relationship between stress and cognitive performance, this is a figure that I had made, um, you know, for classes such as this, um, but it's really revised from York Susan Dodson's kind of curve performance and they called it arousal curve. They were studying how mice responded to um, foot shocks way back when early part of the 1900s, late 1800s kind of work. And notice that if they were in a situation that had a lot of stress, what we would call stress at this point, they did perform, perform poorly on the maze task. If they didn't have any engagement, and this is kind of what I perhaps had seen in some of the rats that I looked at that were just sleeping or grooming themselves and not really responding in the maze, they might've been showing some kind of boredom perhaps. The idea is that there's some kind of optimal level where we don't wanna be on either end of this kind of curve. We see just as an aside, many hormones 
act on these or have actions that are can be represented in these kind of inverted U-shaped curves. It doesn't always mean a lot of hormone means some kind of good behavior. And we certainly see that with thinking about stress hormones and stress levels. Too much stress, we might have been here before, where we have disorganized type of thinking. Maybe there's too much attention on what's producing the stress and not enough attention, which is a limited resource, on the performance that you're supposed to be doing, what kind of cognitive task or any kind of task that you're supposed to be doing. But again, if you're not paying enough attention, or again, you get into the very low levels of brain arousal in terms of stress, then that also is not good for cognitive performance. So one of the questions is always like how for ourselves is how to get into that optimal level. We're not gonna necessarily be able to remove all stressors. Some, hopefully we can, but we have to understand that we can't remove them all. Some of them um, may even become chronic. But the question here is, you know, one, where can you have that resiliency? Maybe to some optimal level of stress or how you respond to that stressor. And this is not a new idea. This is something I'm really interested in. This is something that even Cellier brought up, but it kind of got lost in the literature in a way. But he talked about stress. I mean, I gave you his first definition, but in as he studied this for his career and wrote many, many articles about it and books, he started to describe that, you know, with stress, we have a negative part of stress. He called it distress, but that also we have this kind of positive aspect of stress. He called it eustress, which is probably a bit of a cumbersome term. But the idea here is that there's some good in returning to that balance. Perhaps even as others have followed up and studied is by experiencing that stress that might push you towards maybe some kind of growth. We have, you know, generally just shorten this, just think about stress and it usually is equated to something negative. But I'd like you to think about, well, are there situations where experiencing these stressors could push you into another place, maybe a, something where you're better off afterwards. And that's part of what resiliency can be about. It's perhaps part of what well-being can be about. And so let's talk about well-being now. Just like boredom, well-being can be defined in many ways. I'll define it first as something simply as a feeling sound in body and mind more often than not and generally judging life positively. You know, addressing stress and promoting well-being are critical concerns in schools, especially now. And there's a figure over here with maybe other words that might describe what well-being can involve. In education, we might build upon ideas of positive psychology and thinking about well-being as involving what they call premise, so positive emotions, relationships, engagement, meaning, identities, self-compassion, and also expertise. I'm not gonna go into describing each of these, more so I just wanted to bring up well-being is not a single thing. And um, that can be important when we talk about some of these studies and how might we promote well-being? And did we always find clear results? One way studied about well-being and promoting well-being on campus um, and, and studying it from a research and, and a teaching viewpoint is by looking at the practice of deep listening. Now we have a whole deep listening, the Center for Deep Listening at Rensselaer. The, you can just do a Google search if you wanna know more, um, but here's what the page would look like. This was pioneered by Pauline Oliveros, a musician, a composer, passed away a few years ago, um, but she also was teaching at Rensselaer for years and teaching a class on deep listening. And it was just this one single class. Um, but the whole purpose of this center, while it's at Rensselaer at this point, 
is to promote this in terms of well being, but also in terms of a teaching tool. So I'm not going to get into all the details about what deep listening involves, but to put it simply, it is a type of mindful practice. We talk a lot about mindfulness nowadays, but it's a type of mindful practice. It started with more um, focus on listening, as the name implies, but it's not just listening through our ears. It can also involve things like really focusing on something visually, um, just to just so that you know, it's a, it's a broad type of practice. But this is something that we have expanded on campus. And I'll tell you about some of the studies we've done using this approach. One study was done, this is a study really early on. And this follows some of my, I guess, discontent, maybe some of my boredom in studying stress, believe it or not. Um, and this is years ago, where you know the focus was on produced stress in an animal and a human, and then study what happens, hormones, you know, autonomic functions, and maybe behavioral type of responses, which is interesting and important. But I just felt like something was lacking there. In particular, because I was teaching so much, I was with students so much, um, even outside of the classroom, and because I was focusing more on boredom and these other emotional states, I really wanted to go beyond just studying stress. So this is where I really refocused a lot of the work on, well, how can we look at well-being as well as stress? And so again, I was listening in on my own boredom and that promoted some of these changes in my research and my teaching. This is the thread that's going through the talk today. And I had a chance meeting with a colleague in the arts department, Tomie Han, and this has led to a nearly decade long, still ongoing collaboration. She was teaching a class on deep listening on campus. I was teaching a class at the exact same time um, in the same semester, uh, the class was on stress in the brain. And we had this idea, well, what if we brought students together in a space on campus and looked at well-being or stress measures as both a learning tool, but also as a way to look at the research of this, um, you know, in our classes, just kind of pilot it out in our classes. So that's what we ended up doing. Uh, we ended up doing this in a, um, a, a conference room that has like smart lights. So this is through an engineering program on campus, the lighting enabled systems and applications program. Um, so the lighting can be changed here, you know, it, the, the, the lighting can be changed to be more like what we typically experience maybe in, a, in an office or a classroom, usually fluorescent type lights, to actually using LEDs that mimic how lighting is like outside, just as some examples, but all different ways to change lighting. So we just happen to be doing it in this room. And then we, what we had people do is a type of deep li listening practice. And then we measured their stress levels in different ways before and afterwards. And we also asked them about the, what happened. And as a way to talk about deep listening, let's even just spend a little bit of time doing a practice. Again, this is completely voluntary. I'm gonna lead us through something and you can do it or not. I hope you'll do it. Um, but always, I think when we talk about well being practices, potential well being practices, they always should have some kind of voluntary component to them. So, with this practice, I'll sound a bell to kind of start it, and then I'll be quiet. And then I'll sound a bell to end it to give you a signal that it's over with. But to start the practice, I would be sitting comfortably. If it is comfortable for you and it's helpful, often people do find it helpful to have their feet on the ground flat, just to have kind of not be wiggling around as if, if you can help it. You're not gonna have to do anything in a way, um, but what I'm gonna ask you to do, this is a, gonna be a type of mindful listening practice. What I'm gonna ask you to do is after I sound the bell, we're gonna be quiet. 
for a period of time. And what I want you to do is start listening to things that are close to you at first. You can imagine this. If you feel like it, you can close your eyes. If you don't feel like closing them, I would suggest to just kind of focus them on something and try not to like look around the room because we're trying to focus in on our listening with our ears. So what you're kind of comfortable, but focused with your eyes, opening your ears in a way, listen to something close to you at first. It could be you could hear your body making noises, maybe, maybe not, um, but listen closely. And then from there, whenever you feel like it, try to listen further out. Maybe you're li you can hear people near you, if you're, especially if you're in the room together. And it's okay if you hear people making noises, we can make noises, we're just adding the sound gifts to the environment. So listen outside of your body. Try to see how far you can hear. You know, can you hear something in another room? Can you hear something? I, I don't know how this classroom set up, but perhaps you can hear something outside. And this is what I want you to do. There's not gonna be, you're not gonna, I'm not gonna ask you what happened or have you tell me, ex explain it, but I do want you to focus in on this if you, if you want to. There's no wrong way to do it. Getting my prop out here. I'm just gonna sound this um, once to start it and then we'll, we'll do our listening and then we'll come back once I ring the bell again. Okay, welcome back. So that's one of the types of, one type of deep listening. I kind of made it simpler than what we would typically do. And I made it a little bit shorter, but I wonder maybe some of you were bored by that. And I, that's okay. You know, we did this in the classroom, like I had explained, and some individuals we thought, oh, this is gonna be so relaxing for them. We, we actually did those kinds of listening like we just did there, but for five minutes. So we thought not too long because it might get too boring. You did it for about two and a half, three minutes. Okay, if you were curious. We had the students in that room, you know, we thought, okay, this will be interesting for them, you know, and we you looked at data, but I want to look at some of the words they provided. So we gave them kind of a free writing period after afterwards and we collected those. It's all anonymous. We don't know which student is which. But 
Some students said things like this student. I stared at the dark carpet. It made me feel peaceful, quiet. And then they go into hearing sounds in the room, sounds from their body. Okay, that's what we were kind of predicting what would happen. And hopefully that, that was relaxing for individuals. But then we got a lot of responses that were not like this. Sometimes, um, like this person says, sometimes it's hard to listen to my surroundings. My mind goes a lot of places. And then they go into describing all the places it, their mind went. Some of these are situations, some of these are even it ends, this writing ended with happiness and sadness. And then there was a lot of responses. And this is similar to what it looked like in terms of their um, heart rate data and their other stress measures, but, but I'm not showing all that data right now. Um, but this, we got a lot of these kinds of responses. Way too long, too much free write every time. I get some people find this therapeutic, but it just annoys me. These are the exact same thoughts I'd have every time we've done this. And I knew I've written to this effect before, but it's still true. And it still was what's going on in my head. And I just want to go home and watch Netflix. So we did this over three times, you know, basically every two weeks around this time of year um, on campus. So that got us thinking, why, what, you know, why wasn't it just an overwhelming, like, this was great and I'm relaxed now. But then we realized we hadn't really prepped the students enough, right? We didn't really contextualize this enough, why we were doing this in these two classes. They didn't know each other per se, they just got together. Um, they didn't know each professor either. And it made us think, okay, just doing this alone isn't helpful. Again, well-being is not just one thing and trying to reach it isn't, can't just take one approach. So this is why deep listening as one practice, a mindful practice, there's many different approaches in it. People that do this kind of practice um, do it in different ways. And that's often what works. So uh, we completely revamped how we thought about it. And we ended up having a whole class called Wellbeing Cultivating Curiosity. It's, it's one I still teach. I teach it each year. It's for first year students on campus. But throughout the semester, each time we meet, which is twice a week, so almost 30 times do we meet over the semester, we do different kind of mindful or kind of practices. They don't always have to be mindful practices. We do deep listening in many different ways. This is a another type of deep listening practice where people stand in a circle. And so it has a social component to it. This is pre-pandemic um, where we did, you know, this kind of picture from a few years back. But in doing it, in having these different approaches where students could also opt in and if they knew, okay, we're gonna do deep listening now and they were like, you know what? I've tried it a few times. I really, for whatever reason, don't want to. They were able to do something else. This is not good for research, but we, in this case, we were studying this in terms of the classroom and how people responded by the end of the semester. So it's just one example. We did many different types of things. I'm just focusing on the deep listening here where we just ask people on a Likert scale how much they agree with different statements. Um, and you know, one area with deep listening, we generally compared to prior that prior semester, more people were felt good about it. But I think again, because we contextualized it. We also um, added more of these social components to engage them more so than maybe they weren't ready, especially in the very beginning of the semester in a place they didn't know, they weren't really ready to go anywhere with that kind of deep listening, like the approach that I showed you. So again, listening into the other, the students' boredom and what they described um, made us really think. And again, thinking about well-being is not one thing. Now I like to talk, here's an uh, old, again, from my favorite comic artist, um, but about some of these COVID studies. COVID, at, at least they were completed during COVID times. We were really ramped up and more concerned about well-being, right? We have social distancing. We talked about social isolation as being a major stressor, which we all probably experience. Um, 
And we also thought, okay, now that we know things about doing deep listening with groups, what if we have a, a workshop series for the whole Rensselaer community? So with this series, I'm just have a kind of a screenshot of one of the sessions where they were doing a listening activity. I blanked out all the participants, the ones on the top, but one is me and um, my collaborator, Stephanie Loveless. And then we have our three deep listening practitioners that each led a different type of deep listening. It was all contextualized and it was something that can, people could do more than once. And in this case, we were interested if this would work over Zoom, honestly, right? Without that connection. With the responses, people did say they would have preferred that we were in person, but in general, just to show one piece of data, when we measured um, some of the participants, so we did this as like a, a workshop, but some people could opt in to also provide data anonymously, you know, with a um, IRB approval. But we had individuals do a type of stress test, um, kind of a self-report that focuses on anxiety, cognitive and somatic. So cognitive being like, um, I have negative thoughts. Somatic would be more like I hear my, or I feel my heart beating fast, so questions like that. And we did see in the individuals um, in the pre, compared to the pretest that they did have a lower score suggesting that they had less of this kind of stress. We're hoping to expand on that, replicate it even um, by doing maybe other Zoom. We did this over three different sessions and it replicated over that, but we'd also like to incorporate doing something in person, kind of like what we're doing here today, where some people are in the room and some people, for the different reasons we have our remote. So that's one area that's continuing research. Also, my student was starting his master's right when the pandemic began. Um, so we had to completely change what he was gonna study. He was gonna be looking at stress and cognition in, in different ways. But then he realized, no, we need to also look at the time that we're in. So it was a lot of work for a master's student. Um, to kind of redo his study. This is Patrick, um, Patrick's work, but he did. And he, he still analyzes some of the data, but what he started to ask people is, these are all recruited from the RPI community, but he was looking at students that lived on campus, but we had different semesters where people were on campus, but there was a lot of isolated periods, like where we'd have quarantines, where people couldn't leave the room and couldn't go to class, but they were on campus. Then we had a whole other group of, large group of students that were still at home or, or some other kind of permanent residence, generally at home, and you know only remotely going to classes. And so these were all undergraduates, full-time undergraduates. Um, and basically, things that maybe we're not surprised at, but they reported on having high levels of loneliness and also levels of boredom. And so the next steps is to look at these individuals and see what the relationship is with their cognitive performance, because we did other cognitive kind of tasks as well, all done remotely. So that's all we could do at that time um, in terms of research. And really the question is, um, Although, you know, they reported the boredom, perhaps, what did that mean for their cognitive performance? We also asked them a lot of questions about stress, stress in general, stress related to the pandemic. And so we're going through and still kind of looking at all these relationships. And as a last example of how this work, um, you know, listening in on individual stress, thinking about well-being, noticing things like boredom and perhaps loneliness, a group of students um, came up with this idea, a group of students I worked with came up with this idea to um, design a web-based app. There's a lot of technical features here that's well beyond my expertise, but these students are very, very bright students um, that have com you know, computer science and other engineering and psychology backgrounds. So this group came together and designed this app. The idea being in, in particular when individuals are isolated, we still have periods of isolation on campus or this happens you know, even without the pandemic, is there a way that we can bring people together, kind of match them up in different groups where they can work on games to put it very simply. 
So that's another ongoing project. So I want to end here. Um, just have a slide. This is just a, a picture for us to gaze at if we want to. But really, the ideas I hope to have conveyed is that awareness that stress can occur. This might drive us to reach out for well, some kind of well-being approach. You know, what can this do related to boredom? We might not like it. We might not like how it feels. But you know, boredom may be just like stress. We don't like how it feels, but it's still going to happen. Just like boredom is likely going to happen. What might we use this for good? I don't have all the answers here. Plenty of people that are at this meeting this week have offered up lots of different ideas. Um, but I think you know, just like stress, thinking about that you stress or being um, kind of using stress for your advantage in a way is something we might consider for boredom. We need to think about this also when we use well-being approaches. Um, you know, well-being is not just one thing, and I think it's a problem when people just focus it on like, oh, I can only if I if I can only just listen carefully and do this mindful practice, then of course I'll have good effects, and that doesn't work for everyone. So I think that's also something to consider, right? Listening also to how the how you respond to any one kind of practice. It's really important for overall building that resilience. In my in my mind. One last um, cartoon, but just making us think about how yes, boredom being this one of, one of many signals perhaps that really drives us to do something else. Um, thank you. Questions. Thank you very much, uh, Alicia. Uh, I think you've given us all a lot to think about. And uh, before I ask any of my questions, because you certainly uh, prompted some thinking on my part, I do want to open the floor to every student in the room. If you have any questions, you can just come up to the mic and uh, we can take questions from the mic. And also we have questions online. So anybody would like to come down. Um, we do have one question already online I'd like to read for everyone. Uh, what actionable steps can someone take every day to uh, raise their levels of, sorry, alleviate their levels of stress? Uh, what a great question. Um, and I think I'm not going to be able to give you a prescription, right? I don't think anybody can. Um, I think part of it, and this is what we try to do in the well-being class, I really try to plant, I'm always saying we're planting seeds. Let's try different things. Some you're not going to like, some actually will be very negative for you. Some you'll be bored. I mean, right? Um, and I think that's all of our challenge because we know the stress is gonna happen, all kinds of things. Some things we can't even predict, some things we might be able to predict, some things we can't get out of, but it's really thinking um, and trying different approaches. But you know, one step that I often get students ask this all the time, what do I do with, with stress? What could I do when I don't have time or money? I don't like um, people just thinking that you have to purchase something or you know, buy something and that's the only way to reach well-being as well. So I really like approaches that are kind of, um, they're inclusive to all. And so I think one major actionable step is just focusing on the breathing, right? I mean, even at the science level of it, if we often um, kind of breathe fast, if you even spend minutes just focusing in on your breathing. And you know, you can do this anywhere. I often do it driving in the car to something that I'm usually running late to. Okay. Um, that's a major stressor in my life that I probably could avoid, but I'm a somewhat of a procrastinator too. Um, but anyway, so but breathing in, I mean, just if we take these deeper breaths, try to bring your breath all the way down to your belly if it doesn't normally go there. A lot of times we keep our breaths higher up. If you are, do that and you can count, there's all kinds of breathing techniques you can find websites on, but doing that is one approach. Cause I mean, it really um, taps right into our hormones and our autonomic nervous system. So there's like clear science on that. And so I think that's one helpful way. That's an actionable step. 
Um, and that's one I'll, I'll, I mean, I'll offer up just right now, just uh, in the interest of time and just thinking about, you know, we all have to breathe, but we can do it in this way that we're just more aware, right? And again, also just being like, oh, breathe, you might notice that you're breathing really fast. Again, that awareness of like how you feel, whether we're talking about it psychologically or physically is really key. I mean, being stressed as this signal. Thank you. Our next question actually follows up on that a little bit. So okay. if, if you could uh, explain um, if there are any studies about how deep listening uh, or other mindful practices affect our hormones. That's a really good question um, about deep listening and mindful practices. Um, I, I will say, I know when we did the deep listening approach, and I told you well, a lot of the students were very bored, we did collect sal saliva from them kind of before and after. That's our typical approach um, to be able to measure things like cortisol levels in saliva, the major, one of the major stress hormones. Unfortunately on that, um, you know, we had a small number of subjects, particularly those that did the hormone um, that was optional as it should be, um, but so we really couldn't say anything about it. Um, also because there were so many differences in yeah, how they responded to deep listening, which shouldn't be surprising, but we were surprised at, at first. So those are things that are kind of ongoing. It's been a bit of a, especially with kind of ramping up some of these studies on deep listening, we have an issue because of being distance and not collecting saliva from people in this pandemic time, for sure. Um, so that's one of the issues. Um, and we'd like to really look at some more of these autonomic measures. So looking at like heart rate variability, for example, as even a proxy of those hormone levels because these are connected. Um, and I don't know, I know there's a few studies that have looked at, um, you know, cortisol levels with the meditation, because sometimes we read them in our class, but they're, and so there, there is some work on this, but I'd say that this really looking at these hormone levels and these mindful practices were really in the infancy of, of that. Um, but I think that would be really useful. Um, yeah, so I answered the question, but I don't really have a good answer on that one. Well, I guess as, as you're suggesting, <laughs> it's still in progress, so. Right, right. <laughs> Um, I have a question, um, but I again invite uh, others to come to the mic and uh, write in their questions. But one of my questions actually comes from uh, our first talk of the symposium. Um, we had uh, James Denkert, who's mm -hmm. here in the audience uh, today, mm -hmm. and he was um, uh, saying, if I understood him well, that uh, we do have a lower attention when we have when we're in boredom. So our our, our attention. Uh, is is less focused, and um, it, it it seems to be correlated somehow. But when I'm listening to you today, with this attention on, say, deep listening, or other contemplative practices, it's as if um, there might be a way that we can decide to focus our attention, and thereby uh, reduce our boredom. Uh, that there might be even a, a causation effect uh, is is that is that possible or is it both ways how do you see those those relationships yeah no that's a great question and i i'll say this for boredom but also with stress is that um it's really key to notice that those things are happening or else you're not necessarily going to deal with it however way you deal with it right that again that awareness that self-awareness um i was really surprised when i started teaching you know, and I'd have students just to be like, oh, these are the kinds of ways that us psychologists might study emotions, you know, oh, you can look at these different surveys and, and whatnot, right? More for a class activity. And, but people would write in because they'd have to like respond to it as just a, an assignment, um, more about the activity. Wow, I've never really thought about my emotions before. And I got that kind of response many more times than I ever predicted would happen. Maybe just because I have that background in psychology, I'm like, I'm always thinking about thoughts. Um, but so I've been using those, those um, you know, those responses really stuck with me. And this is years ago. So I think also with stress, with boredom, recognizing that, you know, putting the attention towards it, because then you can, you know, attention can be um, voluntary as well as 
yes, it can be grabbed by when I drop things in the middle of a talk off my desk, but it can also be very voluntarily based. So yes, I think that's the case. Where you can like refocus, um, but you need that signal first. Yeah, and I think uh, as a teacher like you, um, I think that's something I encourage uh, with my students um, because the more you're focused, even listening or doing your reading before class and getting engaged with the material, the more fun it's going to be to explore those ideas. So uh, I, 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 I've experienced that, but I was wondering from you know an expert point of view if there's like evidence to back that up. Um, I'm waiting for some more questions from anyone else, but uh, in the meantime, um, I was also thinking about another guest we had here a couple of years ago, uh, Paul Bloom, mm. who not then, but more recently has published a book, I think uh, entitled uh, The Sweet Spot, where he's talking about um, well-being and, mm -hmm. and uh, joy. And uh, I understand, I haven't quite, uh, I haven't read it yet. Uh, I've just discovered it. But uh, I understand that he's uh, saying that well-being is something that is uh, not identified with pleasure. And that very often today, which I, I noticed you didn't do, uh, you, you didn't uh, identify well-being with pleasure. Um, and, and he says, in fact, he thinks he takes more of the Viktor Frankl route, where uh, well-being is more a product of purpose, of, of meaning and, and deep joy. And I wonder um, what you think of that uh, in terms of pleasure is, is what is the, the relationship between pleasure and well, well-being and is there also a, a need for pleasure? Well, uh, yeah, no, I, I agree with, the, um, with that idea that well-being is not just, oh, feeling good all the time or like feeling happy all the time or feeling pleasure all the time. There's there's places for that, but I really think the importance of all of our emotions. Um, so I fall in that same kind of camp. Um, I know sometimes, especially with positive psychology, that approach, a lot of it is focused on just the positive. Um, but I really think that we need to still recognize and not ignore when we have these negative emotions. And it doesn't necessarily, even though we might not like them, it doesn't necessarily mean they're all bad, right? Because um, we need to do these things, right? We need to sometimes feel sadness to then deal with maybe a grief that we're experiencing or you know a loss that we're experiencing, I should say. Um, and it doesn't mean you're not well when you're you know dealing with life experiences. So it's really thinking about it more over time with well-being and, and like kind of generally a positive thing, but over time, not like all the time. Mm -hmm. So know? yeah, it's it, the assessment of our emotions on sort of a more general a scale than uh, on a like minute to minute kind of countdown. Right, there's that. And also I think I also, um, just like I don't only wanna promote, oh, this well-being technique and it costs a lot of money and it's really hard to do and all of that, because it's completely misses a lot of people. I think it's the same case with we think about well-being as only, oh, feeling, let's see, feeling pleasure. Then if you put such, I guess you're thinking about it as like such a high bar, then so many people say, oh, well, I guess I can't, you know, and, and then, but there's so many other ways they could reach it. So that's where I have, I have a tension with that when, when I hear about, oh, well-being is just like being happy and, you know, feeling pleasure all the time. Because no, I mean, it's really feeling this balance. There's going to be stress. There's going to be times of you stress, right? Um, there's going to be the good and the bad overall. And it's like, what can, is it possible to use those things as signals when we feel bad or when we feel good um, and then drive us? You know, I also tell, talk about to the students as like the older person in the room, like, hey, things that work for you with well-being when you're 17 might not work for you the same when you're in your 20s or when you're in your 30s and 40s and whatnot. So that's another thing to consider to, um, there's, not no, there's no one way to reach it. Thank you. And Thank nowadays you. we're studying how that works, you know. Um. Thank you. Uh, we have a question on the floor. Hi, well, it just took a minute. 
Okay. Hi. Thank you very much, Alicia, for that. That was really interesting. And today I learned some new things. I, at the risk of repeating what Sheila, uh, what Sheila was asking earlier, because I felt like she took my question, and then I thought, get over it, just say it in different words. Um, I want to, I think it's important to try to, to, in fact, talk about it again, if you don't mind. I, I learned something today about, well, we, you were talking about stress. And I thought about it as something that's completely um, opposite of, of uh, boredom, because when you're bored, you, you are like sort of spaced out, you're, you're, you're not really paying attention to things. But what I learned about stress was that in the same way, you can't really pay attention to things. And your, um, your whole idea about deep listening and being attentive seems to me an antidote, antidote to both boredom and stress. And so it's interesting, this, this course that you have, well-being, cultivating curiosity. I mean, curiosity is the opposite of boredom. And, and, how, and this is something I think is so important for our students because there are this is something that we learned in one of the lectures, although I, I can't remember which one it was, uh, where somebody talked about there's different times in your life where you're more or less bored. And this is, this is a period where apparently, statistically, you guys are really bored. Now, I don't know what that's about, but you know, I have kids, they're all bored with everything. They're like, oh, I just got out of a history class. It was really boring. And I think, how can that be boring? So uh, I think if we stopped and we actually paid attention, like paid attention to each other, paid attention to the moment, this whole movement in mindfulness, then mm -hmm. that is in itself a cure for boredom because boredom is not being able to pay attention. And one of the reasons we don't pay attention is because we don't understand. Now that was mentioned by, I think, Andreas Alfadoro. On, on, on Monday, when we don't understand something, then we lose our attention, like we're not. So just bringing us back always to the moment, like if you don't understand what's going on out there, take a moment to figure out what's going on with yourself mm -hmm. and then bring yourself back in. So I, I thought it was worth repeating. I don't think I have, I don't even know if I'm asking a question, but it seems to me that you're talking about uh, this uh, deep listening and um, um, uh, mindfulness is, is useful both for stress and for uh, boredom. Is that correct? There's a question, yeah. is that correct? Yeah, <laughs> thank you for the question. No, those great, great comments though. Um, you got me excited when you brought up curiosity. <laughs> um, you know, I didn't kind of go that route today, but that is something, you know, it's, that's something I'm usually thinking about and certainly in the classroom of like, okay, well, let's try this and see how it works. Let's be curious about it. Because especially, I wonder like, how is it you have a young child, they're curious about everything because they don't understand anything that's happening, I guess. And they interact with their worlds in many ways, sometimes causing damage, <laughs> sometimes maybe not what we would do as adults, but at some point we stop doing that as like in general, you know, and I certainly see this in teaching college students that are 17, 18, as well as the ones that are about to graduate in their early 20s, um, that a lot of times that curiosity is lost. And so then, yes, <laughs> there comes that boredom. Um, but there's also that, I think, self-directed curiosity, too, that is important, especially with well-being, like, okay, can I try these things? And is that going to be helpful for me? And so to at least go out there and kind of... Um, try them out yeah it might end up being that the curiosity is gone but then um maybe not right so it's like worthwhile um i think especially i guess it's not on that figure but if you're under such high stress that you're coming too focused on the stressor which is adaptive if it's like a predator for sure but that's not usually what we're dealing with as humans nowadays um, if you're so focused on those things that are producing the stress, especially ones that can't really be alleviated or, you know, completely go away, then you don't have those resources to fo refocus the attention on something like you want to learn about, right? Something that might drive you, something that makes you curious. So yeah, that's why that, that course is titled that. I know it's a little bit of a awkward <laughs> title of a course and students are like, what is this course about? But, you know, right away, I kind of explain it. Um, and we do a lot of analysis of like what happened after that. And sometimes they share it, sometimes it's kept private, sometimes it turns into the course is a, a actually a writing course, a creative, it doesn't have to be creative, but um, we do a lot of creative uh, practices in that course as well. Again, to try to drive that curiosity, do things that they don't do in their engineering courses. <laughs> so they generally find that, um, I guess they find pleasure in that, um, to go back to the last question from Sheila. 
Yeah, uh, um, for sure. Sandy Mann actually talked about, I'll just, I'll give it back to you in a second. Mm -hmm. uh, Sandy Mann talked about that yesterday. She talked about how children uh, are, are so, um, uh, they're not, they don't, they're, they tend not to be bored. They're running around. They, they jump in puddles because puddles are interesting. Mm -hmm. Everything is interesting to them. Whereas you grow up and puddles stop being interesting. And it's mm -hmm. kind of true. If you jump into a puddle, you might look a little bit, you know, odd, but you have to, uh, the, I love the course name, Wellbeing, Cultivating Curiosity. I would take that. I think it's, it's really great. <laughs> So yes, anyway, that's that's all for my question. And again, I invite anyone to come up. See, I broke the ice. I came. It's not that hard. You got a mask on. Nobody will recognize you. Anyway, I'll go back. And <laughs> I don't see any more questions right now. And actually, we are approaching the end of our time. Oh, so oh, yeah. I, I would like to really thank you very much, Alicia Wall, for uh, spending some time with us and sharing um, your research and your ideas and your insights with us today. And I'm sure we're going to take this with us uh, in our lives as we move forward. So thank you very much. Oh, thank you again for having me. I really, really enjoyed speaking with everyone today. And thank you for all of you guys. I, I also want to thank the, the you guys, the Vanity College uh, Student Association for um, uh, for funding this in part. You're, you're all part of that. The Vanier College Teachers Association, the Faculty of General Education, uh, Communications, Bruce Norton, we couldn't do this without him. Uh, our tech guys in the back, Carlos and, and David, love them. And so there's so many people that made this possible. I just wanna say thank you to all of you.